On behalf of Campaign for Liberty, I'd like to welcome you. Campaign for Liberty's mission is to promote and defend the greatest American principles of individual liberty, constitutional government, sound money, free markets, and peace by utilizing education, issue advocacy, and grassroots mobilization. So why are, you, why are we here tonight? At this time, we have federal agents and citizens standing against each other over the, infringe, the infringements of uh, state property. The IRS is being used as a weapon of suppression against political opposition. And the head of law enforcement can decide to prosecute or not violations of civil liberties on the basis of skin color or sexual preference. And let's not forget the NSA is watching us all. Are we really living under a constitutionally limited government? I ask myself that every day. Well, it is critical for you to know who you are voting for, why you are voting for, and after you provide your vote, you need to commit yourself to holding their feet to the fire and making sure that they adhere to all their promises. The United States Constitution says that the country is a federation of sovereign states and that the powers not specifically granted to the federal government are retained by those states. State governments in the U.S. are relatively powerful. Each state has its own independent criminal and civil, civil law codes, and each state manages its internal government. So the government heads the executive branch in each state and has considerable control over the budgeting, the power to appoint officials, and a role in legislation. That's why we're here. Thanks again for attending. And Chris, it's on you. Craig. That's right, Jim. Thank you. Craig, there you go. I, I have a couple of things. Um, first off, random order. I have their uh, candidates' names on these paper, we just random order for how they're gonna start with their opening uh, arguments or statements. And then we'll go first, second, and third. And then at the end, we'll go three, third, second, and first. And then we'll have questions and everything in, the, in, the, in, the, in between. Uh, Kevin, I guess just pick one and that'll start us. Okay, Gordon's going first. Bruce is going second. And May is going third. Before we start that, uh, let's see. Debbie and Colby have three by five cards, correct? Yes. If you'd like to uh, ask questions, raise your hand or ask. We'll happily do that, and uh, throughout the evening. Okay. So while we're doing that, I uh, want to get right to it. Gord Gordon Charlstrom, our first gubernatorial mm -hmm. candidate for the state of Oregon. Welcome, and give us five minutes. Thank you. Thank you all for showing up. My name's Gordon Chalstrom. I'm a Medford businessman. I'm not a career politician and I'm not a lawyer. It's because I'm a businessman and a grandfather that I got into this race. But I want to tell you a few things about me beforehand. I grew up in Salem, Oregon for 16 years, the first 16 years of my life. I went out and I was picking strawberries and beans and cherries to pay for my school clothes. Grew up in a small, poor family. Then at age 16, my mother moved our family to Reno, Nevada. It was there that I continued my work ethic. When I uh, got to Reno, I went to work for Albertsons at age 17. And at 20 years, I was the youngest grocery manager in Albertsons history. I went to college at University of Nevada, Reno. Started college in 1991 and graduated in 1993. Got a four-year degree in two years. Carried 27 units a semester and graduated with a 3.0 average. After graduation, I moved to Medford, Oregon and started CW Concrete. In 2007, we, had, we were doing over $7 million worth of concrete and had 40 plus employees. Then the recession hit. And then I was able to spend some time focusing on what was going on in Salem and Washington, D.C. because I wasn't needed as much time to manage my business. The more I saw what was going on in Salem and Washington, the matter I got. So last September, I closed up CW Concrete and sold off the equipment. And then January of this year, I announced my run for candidacy. 
I've got eight grandchildren, seven of them right here in the Rogue Valley, and their future is being stolen and hijacked by the people up in Salem, Oregon. And last I checked, they didn't vote for one of those people, and it's just wrong. And as a businessman, I, it's clear to me what the problems are. The taxes are too high, the regulations are too many, and the power is structured up in Salem, Oregon. It's hard for you folks to, to address your government when you have to drive 225 miles to address a representative. I want to bring the power and the government back down to the local level. I want it at county level so that you can drive across town to go to your uh, county commissioners and address your issues right there and then. Right now, Oregon has the second highest income tax in the nation. And they have the third highest personal income tax in the nation. A, a, a second highest corporate income tax, excuse me. Corporations don't pay taxes. They collect them from each and every one of you that when you buy a service or a product from them. I think we should eliminate the corporate income tax and invite businesses to come back to Oregon. Most of the small business people in Oregon are either S corporations, LLCs, or partnerships. Their profits roll through to their personal income taxes. With our high tax rate on the personal incomes, it is starving the resources that a business owner needs to grow their business, to invest in a business, or to start a business. We need to lower our taxes drastically. Our education system, it's getting more and more costly every time we turn around but yet the results are going down and down and down. Oregon ranks 43rd in the nation in education prospects. We have a graduation rate that's under two-thirds of the population, or our students. I propose that we close the Oregon Department of Education and take the money spent on that bureaucracy and funnel it down to the 197 school districts. We can hire more teachers with that money. PERS has gotten so big and burdensome on the state that it's the big elephant in the room. That's why our education system is failing. That's why we're letting prisoners out of jail. PERS has gotten so big and expensive, governments haven't funded it 100% and now they're having to play catch up. Here in the Medford School District, PERS accounts for 23% of the school budget. It's no wonder we're short on teachers, we're short on books. We have to catch up and pay our PERS. We need to redesign and refigure out what we're going to do with PERS. I don't think it should be adjudicated in this state. You know, the U.S. Supreme Court has an inherent conflict of interest. They are PERS recipients. If we want to get a fair deal on how we look at PERS, we need to go to the Supreme Court or the Ninth Court of Appeals. And I think as a businessman, I know better what the climate needs to be like for Oregon to prosper and have more freedom. I've never been in politics before. My allegiance is to the families and small businesses of this state. And I would just leave you with this. If you elect a lawyer, you get more laws. Elect a businessman and you get more jobs. And it's jobs that this state needs. Thank you. My name's Gordon Chalstrom and I ask for your vote. Uh, Bruce, please, your five minute opening statement. Well, I broke my glasses, so it's going to look kind of weird, but I need them. After 40 years old, you need glasses. I'm Bruce Cuff. Uh, I'm a candidate for governor to uh, send Mr. Kitzhopper home. Um, I was born in the Brooks area, uh, same, same basic area that uh, Gordon was born in. We probably worked in the same fields together out there, picking cherries and berries and beans and School clothes were, were one of those things that we, we needed to do, had to do it. Uh, I, uh, I uh, graduated from Jervis High School. My dad was a barber for 43 years in the Brooks area. So from the time I was about five years old on, I've been taught how to run the state of Oregon, a lot better than the folks that are doing it now. And of course, there's a lot of crazy ideas that you hear in the barber shop, but there are a lot of good ideas that you hear. So. Um, a lot of those good ideas I'd, I'd like to put to work. My, my dad's been gone 10 years as of April 19, but one of the things he said to me was, Bruce, if you ever run for office, you write down on paper what you're gonna do and you let people know. So back on that table, I have, I have three strategies to get local control back into our communities for education, law enforcement, land use planning, and I also have a new tax system that's going to um, change the way that we tax. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but 
Um, I attended Oregon State for a couple of years and uh, had to borrow some money to go there the second year and I didn't couldn't figure out how I was going to get through there without having a big debt. So uh, when the recruiter was over uh, talking to my brother about joining the U.S. Army, I asked him if there was anything electronics and of course there always is when you're talking to a recruiter. So uh, I signed up for the military for delayed entry. I went my second year to school. I met my wife on my second year at Oregon State University. So we've got four kids and we've been married 32 years. We've got a couple grandkids. So uh, the three most important things happened to me at Oregon State. Basically, I recommitted my life to Christ at Oregon State. I had a, a roommate who was a strong Christian, had had an influence on me, met my wife there. The third thing that happened was Ronald Reagan got elected President of the United States. And Ronald Reagan changed the course of this country. We, we were in a demise. We were basically the, what we're, what, where we are in Oregon right now. We're in the same boat, basically, here than we were in 1980 with Carter being president. We're looking at, we're looking at our economy and we're saying, man, is this ever going to get Can we get out of this mess? Well, I've got, I've got a proposal to do that. And it's written, it's on paper, and it'll work. But uh, Ronald Reagan... Uh, his conservative principles are what I was raised on, and that's how I'm going to run the state of Oregon. Um, I'm a big states' rights person. When it comes to, well, we're talking about uh, local control, uh, getting local control back in law enforcement. The 36 county sheriffs in this state are the chief law enforcement officers in Oregon. And before any federal officer has a right to talk to any one of our citizens, they need to talk to the sheriff in that county first. That's going to stop what happened down in Nevada, uh, in Salem area where, where I was uh, this summer. Uh, some of the U.S. agriculture people showed up. They stopped the man's blueberries from going to the cannery because they wanted to verify that the migrant workers were getting paid minimum wage. And they were making 200 bucks a day because they were getting paid by what they picked, by the piece instead of by the hour. And he, he almost cost them $40,000 by stopping that going to the cannery. That's got to stop. They're never going to do that again in Oregon. In Oregon, they're going to check in with a sheriff or, or they're going to be arrested. Because uh, my slogan is, enough is enough, it's time for Bruce Cuff. And what that means is, it's, there's enough that's, you know, Dennis Richards has been in office 10 years. Time to go home, Dennis. Term limits. John Kitzhopper's been in office 12 years. Time to go home. Enough is enough. When it comes to these federal folks that are using the powers of government to um, basically go after conservatives, no more. No more. Not in Oregon. We're not going to do that. So I'm an Oregonian first, born and bred. Uh, the only time I was out of, the, out of Oregon was when I was in the U.S. Army, served four years uh, in the Army, spent four year, three years in Germany and worked a year as a civilian over there in Germany before I came back here. So that's who I am. But I've got a proposal here for uh, three strategies for local control, and it's about, it's about funding education locally. If we can't fund it locally, you can't control it. And that's what the tax structure is about, too. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the questions, and then we'll explain this a little bit more. But uh, uh, the slogan is, enough is enough, it's time for Bruce Cuff, and I, I uh, would appreciate your vote, and thanks for being here tonight. Thanks. May Rafferty. Well, hello. Um, glad to have an opportunity to talk to you all. Um, yeah, you know, I used to um, work out in the field too. I worked for a very more seed company, and so we all kind of did the same kind of stuff. <laughs> and I also worked at some of the fruit orchards, sorting fruit. And I had a paper route. Got up early in the morning, Idaho statesman. And, did that for several years in high school and some in college. So um, anyway, um, <clears throat> well, I got involved in this. Um, you know, I, I, I have to say I've got a lot of respect for both of these two candidates that are here tonight. Um, I think they're, you know, they have some really good conservative values. And But I got involved in this because there's one issue to me that nobody seemed to be addressing. and. Um, what, that was, what that's about is one of the candidates, that's Mr. Dennis Richardson, who's not here tonight, he has been involved in a, a plan or 
there's some, some of our legislative people have been involved in this and what it's called is called the Made in Oregon plan and it, it's designed to help encourage Chinese factories into Oregon and I'm very opposed to this you know a Chinese factory is not just a Chinese factory not not to be prejudiced or anything but all of your large companies like that from China they're going to be owned by the communist government so what we would be looking at is we would be looking at having government-owned businesses operating in Oregon and Chinese government-owned businesses if that is allowed to be encouraged and so I'm very opposed to someone such as Dennis being a governor in the state because he does not understand apparently what it is to be an American and the pride of doing for ourselves and he just doesn't get it and and so that's largely why I filed um, I wanted to um, talk about that and now the other thing is I'm very very much in favor of reducing regulations and and doing so as quickly as possible um, you know one one way I think that we could do it real quick is if we were to um, go back to the old law archives and we might find maybe a 1959 set of law books maybe in particular the ones that would relate to land use and, and we might say you know what let's just we'll just change the date to 2015 and we're all done and, and make it real quick and easy <laughs> you know you, you look at what it takes these legislators they have to go through hours and hours and, and, and years and years and decades and decades trying to figure this stuff out and, and we need immediate deregulation we need our freedom back you know, I think freedom is really the big issue here, not so much jobs. I mean, if we, if we were free to use our property, if we're free to use the public lands, then, then we're going to be a lot better off. And, and it's not just about money, it's about happiness. Um, you know, the, our, our legislative body here, they, um, I don't know, they, they fight over things that don't matter. And, and in Idaho, the state that I'm from, They've already submitted a, a resolution. It's called the House Concurrent Resolution Number 22. And um, the first sentence here just says, a concurrent resolution stating legislative findings and demanding that the federal government extinguish title to Idaho's public lands and transfer title to those lands to the state of Idaho. So we can do the same thing here. But unfortunately, we have Kit Hopper, and apparently he just, I don't know, I don't know where he is. He's lost somewhere. He's, he's off on worrying about Cover Oregon and things like that that we really don't want here. Um, we don't want Cover Oregon. We don't want Obamacare. And I think possibly what we're going to need to do is to go ahead and uh, start up a, a citizen militia and, and just get people kind of organized so that when the state stands up to the federal government. The states are going to have to start flexing their muscle because that's the only way that we're going to we're going to we're going to make it. I mean, when, when you've got a bully bullying you, you, you don't just um, give him a little shove. You get real serious, and that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to get real serious, and and the states are going to have to carry the weight because the federal government's just not getting it. And I think if the states you know, stand up for their sovereignty and, and also look at becoming debt free and, and, and holding their own weight, not expecting the federal government to give us money because they don't have money anyway. I mean, they just borrow it from China and, and where does that put us? I mean, not a good spot at all. So, thank you. Okay, now that our three candidates have been, uh, completed their opening statement. Uh, we have a, a cross-examination period of time tonight. Also want to include the two candidates that are not here this evening in relation to a rhetorical question. Uh, Dennis Richardson was not able to be here, sends his regrets. Uh, Darren Carr uh, also could not be here at the last minute due to some family uh, needs. And then Tim Carr is absent this evening. But if the three candidates that are here would like to address an issue with the other candidates that are not here, they have the freedom to ask a rhetorical question. I'm not going to time that, 
but I'm going to ask the candidates, do you have any rhetorical questions for any of the candidates that are here this evening? Gordon? Okay. You know, I have, here we go. I have a question for Bruce. I'm for uh, local control of the education. Uh, Bruce's plan is to bring in a countywide sales tax. Well, in my travels across the state, you know, you get up to Gillum County, there's more windmills in Gillum County than there are people. There's 1,145 people. I just can't see where a sales tax would be fair on the citizens to cover the, the road servicing, the schools, the public service. I, I just don't see how it would work in a fair way across all the counties in the state. I could see where it could work in the counties on the west side, but on the east side, they just don't have the population numbers to uh, adequately fund education, police, roads, and uh, all of the services that are necessary. I, I just would like him to break that down for me and, and enlighten me. I mean, I am about local control. I just want to see how those numbers theoretically would really work. Bruce, two minutes. Okay. Um, Gordon and I have talked about this already, but... Uh, Basically, if you want local control of your schools, you must fund them locally. What we got going on right now is welfare. You know, the schools that don't have enough money to fund their schools, they're getting help by the other people. So if you really want local control of your schools, then you got to fund them locally. And, and what does that mean? That means that you, you have the school system you can't afford, right? So if you can't afford the teachers and the administrators that you currently have, then you're going to have to cut some salaries. You're going to have to change technology. There's a lot of technology out there now that you can educate kids for a lot less money than what we're doing. So, but every single county, to me, that is not the state's business. If you want local control for your schools, every single school district in the county, it's the county's business. It's not the state's business. So, you know, I, I understand Gordon's question, but you know what? We can't mother may I every single county in every single school district. If they want local control, and, and that's what they keep telling us, then they need to fund their own schools. And if that means their, their tax rate's a little bit higher, that means if their tax rate's a little bit higher short term, that means they need to attract some business in there to spread that out so they can lower their tax, their tax rate and have more business in there. But every single county needs to determine their own destiny. That's what they want, and it, until they get it, if you keep the money at the state, the state is going to continue to control education. That's what that's what Gordon's for is just keeping the money at the state and then somehow block granting it to the counties. It's not going to work. If the state has it, it's got to go through the budgetary process. The unions are going to be in control of what's going on with those 90 legislators and nothing's going to change. So my plan is to cut the real property taxes, cut personal property taxes, inheritance taxes, cut capital gains taxes, Cut all the taxes and just have a local sales tax in each county that's voted in by the county. And that's the only tax you'd have. You'd have a 6% income tax at the state, and then the counties would have their sales tax. And that's all you'd have. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Bruce, you have a question for either one of the other candidates. I'll ask Gordon this one, because this is, this is the flip side of what we just said. How in the world are you going to give schools local control if you keep the money at the state and fund it from the state, number one. And number two, the superintendent for education is a constitutionally elected position in order. How are you going to just, uh, you're just going to get out your pen like Obama and just get rid of the Department of Education and the superintendent of education? I'm just kind of curious how you're going to do that. Sure. Two minutes. No, it's leadership. And you got to have the will to uh, think outside the box. I think you can propose a bill to the legislature and have them change the, uh, the law as it's currently written. You know, and all I want to do is, I want to get rid of the bureaucracy in Salem. It's peeling off a lot of money up there. That's money that's better spent for teachers in the local classrooms than it is up there. I mean, the uh, people up there in Salem, they're, like I said before, they're more concerned with the name of the mascots of the high schools than the product they're putting out. When we have over a third of our kids not graduating and more and more control coming in Salem, we need to get rid of that control and spread it back out. As far as uh, the local school districts, 
There's 197 of them. I think they could form an association to set statewide standards for curriculum, teacher tenure, teacher qualification, and the length of the school year. I mean, Oregon currently has one of the shortest school years in the nation, and we need to get our children educated or else, you know, they're the ones that's gonna be paying for our retirement and, and supplying, they're, they're our future. We need to educate them so that they have the skills to take care of us as we get older. We have to depend on them. And that's the way I see it. I block granting the money to them. Uh, with regards to the uh, teachers you need to know, I've given some thought that with the technology you're talking about, why don't we give all the legislators notebooks? They can stay in their home district when they're voting, and that way the lobbyists don't have a, you know, they're not all herded together in one pen, and the lobbyists can't uh, circle them and uh, attack them. It would be harder for a lobbyist to get to the legislator if they were spread out all over the state. And you could still have a quorum with a notebook and everybody would be signed up and you could have the vote counting going on in the Capitol. That's the way I'd take care of that. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, it now goes to May. And May, you have a choice of asking either one of the candidates a question for them. All right, so I can't ask both of them the question? Well, I'll start with one. Start with one, does that mean yeah, I can ask them both? For, can I ask them both for, the same question? Yes, you may. Okay. So, um, the Obamacare, the Affordable Health Care Act, um, you know, personally I'm totally opposed to it as well as Cover Oregon. And, um, you know, I think that personally that the states need to stand up to the federal government about that and protect the citizens who do not wish to sign up for it and do not wish to have to pay penalties on their taxes because they don't sign up for it. I think that the state needs to cover the people on that. In other words, some um, protect them. So May, what's the and, question um, for you? So the question is um, to both of them then is, um, you know, where do they stand on, on that idea? I mean, w would they go along with that or do they think that we're going to have to buckle down to the feds and, and do what we're told, or what do they think? Gordon, you want to respond to that? you got two minutes to respond. Well, Obamacare and Cover Oregon are abysmal failures. I think they have no right coming between the patient and their doctor. That is strictly a personal issue. Uh, you know, in 2009, I penned a fix for uh, the healthcare industry. And it was about seven items that are very simple, you know. Number one, allow the insurance policies to cross state lines. And you would see policy prices go down much like you see with automobile insurance. Uh, number two, make the premium tax deductible, just like it is for businesses currently. That's a cost of business. It should be a cost of living. Number three, you cover pre-existing. You cover prescription, you have a no drop clause, uh, you have catastrophic care, and you provide annual maintenance so you can get a checkup every year to see where you're at. And by letting these policies cross state lines, you would see the premiums go right down through the floor. It's only when the government gets involved. Currently, over 55% of the premium costs in the state of Oregon is mandated by the health insurance department of the state of Oregon. Get the government out of the way. Let the free market system work. You're either a free market believer or you're not. If you're not a free market believer, then you're a believer that the big government is the solution. I think it is the problem. We need to eliminate the problem and let the free market reign. Bruce, your response to May's question of whether or not you would allow Obamacare or Cover Oregon into the state, where's your stand on that? Well, uh, Cover Oregon, uh, Obamacare, we, we don't have Obamacare in Oregon. We have Cover Oregon, which was put in by two, two legislative bills that even if they got rid of Obamacare, we'd be stuck with what we have. So we need to appeal those two bills, get rid of those. And in my mind, there's a big difference between health insurance and health care. Because, uh, you know, back when uh, Kitzhaber set up Oregon Health Plan, that was not even health care, it's rationed health care. It's, it's a ranking of every single service, giving and get a ranking and then deciding how much money you have and then deciding you're cutting it off right here and everything below that you're not funding. 
That's basically what we have in Care Oregon. It's the same plan. It's a it's a rationed health care. It's it's not, uh, and it's insurance, and it's way too expensive. So I'm with Gordon. I say let them let them go across state lines. Let these insurance companies cross state lines. Get back to the private sector. Uh, you know, in our country, um, for some reason, the government thinks their job is to eliminate all risk from our lives. That's become their function. And without risk, there's no freedom. There is no freedom without risk, right? As soon as, as soon as the government gets involved and they unconstitutionally start getting involved, saying, "Oh, this is a good idea. We need to, we need to, we need to eliminate this risk from the public's lives." Well, your freedom's gone. If you don't have the risk, if you don't have the ability to succeed, you don't have the ability to fail. You really can't fail. You know, if there's a ceiling and there's a floor, then you know that's not freedom. Freedom's when when you have the ability to succeed. And the, with the health care system that we currently have, it, it just needs to be scrapped. We need to just go back to the private system. Thank you. OK, have any other uh, questions? Bruce, do you have a question for either one of the candidates? Because we might move on to the next segment if you don't. You got asking you. Oh, me? Oh. Yeah, if you'd like to ask a question of either of your fellow candidates. And if not, we'll no, okay. yeah. Let's we'll move right along because we've got a lot of questions tonight. Okay, good. Correct. Just want to make sure if any candidates have uh, questions. Rhetorical. For, for right, absolutely. Yeah. Candidates. We thought since we had missing candidates tonight, uh, any rhetorical questions for any of our candidates that are not here this evening? I'll ask. That. I'll ask. Bruce, that. we were in front of. Well, I'll start with a statement, then I'll ask a question. Uh, we were in front of the Willamette Week. Uh, uh, all six of the gubernatorial candidates, and the question was asked of Mr. Richardson, name one thing that you would do for Oregon. What, what's the most important thing you think needs to have happen? And uh, Mr. Richardson's comment was, well, we're going to look around to see what the other states are doing well, and we're going to do that. And the guy said, well, wait a minute, Mr. Richardson, you've been in the legislature 10 years, and you have been running for governor for a year, surely you have one item that you would do for Oregon. And then you start talking about education and health care, fixing those things. And of course, you know, Gordon and I are up there going, jobs, jobs, jobs is what we need in Oregon, you know. But that's the question, Dennis. Do you have it figured out what you'd actually do for Oregon? That's the question. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Our, our next segment, we've got questions from the audience on 3 by 5 in not necessarily any order, and we'll move right on that. Um, these questions are for all the candidates, so uh, two minutes each, and this is related to uh, Common Core and Agenda 21, and uh, our order at this point goes to May. Uh, do you explain briefly your understanding of a, a UN Agenda 21, and do you have an opinion on Common Core? Um, yeah, the UN Agenda 21, um, you know, I'm not, per to be perfectly honest, I'm not as up on it as, should, as I should be, but basically what I understand is it has a lot to do with land grabs, and um, it's all wrong. It's, um, you know, it, it, I think a lot of it's the the... The, what they call these days, I don't know if you folks have been hearing this term, but neo-environmentalism. And, and so we have people that pretend that they're for the environment, and then they come in and, and try to take control of the land and, and take it away from us. And it's just really insanity. Um, you know, they limit our land use, private and public, and then, and then they say, well, we're broke, so we need some Chinese investment in here. It's just pure insanity. Um, so, you know, if the states can get on board with this situation um, where we could reclaim our, our land and, and just take control of it, then I don't think we'll have to, to deal with those people. I mean, they may want to sue us, but I don't know. I think there's, there's got to be ways out of it. It's, it's just ridiculous. Um, and, and then, of course, um, the Common Core, that's um, insanity as well. Um, basically, you've got, um, again, there is some neo, and probably like neo-Nazis, I don't know what they are, but the people that want to um, change the minds of the children 
to think a certain way which is not even the natural way of thinking. And, and so, you know, they set up this education system that, you know, I've heard, you know, they, they want to tell you that three and three is 35, or I don't know, I don't know, just something crazy like that, you know, or they want you just to estimate figures and, and if, you know, if you give the correct answer, you're wrong, I don't know, I've heard stuff like that. I've heard, I've heard things to where, you know, they have lessons to where they want to get the students to think about, um, you know, what would, it, what would it be like if you were a German soldier and, and you know, why, why would you, you know, want to, you know, be nice to the Christians? I, I don't know, I can't remember the exact lesson, but it had, had to do with making the, the children warp their mind. And I'm sorry, I went over a bit. Thanks. Gordon, explain your understanding of UN 21, Agenda 21, and an opinion on Common Core. Well, Common Core was established, the uh, curriculum was established by the UN. Agenda 21 is about a one world government. It's about taking control and removing our constitution as our way of life. I'm totally opposed to it. You know, you look at uh, what our governor proposed last legislative session. He believed that preschool should start at the age of two years old. You see, what, what this is, it's the government's attempt to become the, the model or the uh, guardian of the child and, and get in between the parents and the children. That's not their job. You know, under Common Core and our, our current governor, they're teaching graphic sexual education to children. And it's in, of such a graphic nature that I can't repeat it here. But it's totally disgusting, you know. Sexual education or sex education is something that goes between the parents and the child at the appropriate time when the parent finally grows up and can explain it to the child. That's the way it comes down. But, uh, you know, I believe that we need, that's another reason to get rid of state-controlled schools at the state level. Get it at the county level where if you have a, a school district trying to impose something on this, you can go down there in, in, in a crowd and make your voices heard at the school board and you can affect some change. But when it's being mandated from Salem and it's tied to the money that comes from Salem, you have no control. We need to get rid of that bureaucracy. We need to eliminate Agenda 21 and definitely eliminate Common Core, uh, Common Core and let the parents do their job. That's my answer. Bruce? Well, kind of the way I think about Agenda 21 and Common Core, um, you know, just reading the things about it is basically it's remaking society without God. I mean, it's basically taking God out of society and saying, you know what, we, we have a better way. Uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, I spank my kids. You know, when they need a spanking, they got a spanking, you know. And, and some people say, well, I would never harm my child. I wasn't harming them. I was disciplining them, and and you know uh, I found out timeout don't work real good with little boys, you know I mean it don't, you know they kind of wonder why they're sitting in the corner, you know so agenda 21 has to do with you know letting the village raise the child instead of the parent is what it's all about, and Common Core is just a way of indoctrinating them with what the federal government or the international uh, internationalists want. You know, when our Supreme Court justices start quoting international law to make their decisions, which a number of them have done, that's a mistake. They need to be sticking to the U.S. Constitution, and, and as soon as they start doing that, those decisions should be thrown out. And, and the, legis or the House of Representatives should be directing the judges to say, look, you can't use international law to be making decisions in the U.S. courtroom. You're going to be using our Constitution, or you're going to be removed. From, from being a judge. So um, I think it's pretty serious what's going on, but there again, I mean, we're heading down a track where um, there are a lot of people in this country that uh, they view Christianity as a threat to their agenda, and they're trying to remake society based on God being out of it. And so my question is, when it comes to inalienable rights that are written in our Constitution, that are given by God, as soon as you decide you don't believe in God, where do those rights come from? They can take them away. If the government gives them, the government can take them away. So that's the way they think. So as soon as they remove God from the picture, we're in trouble. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce. The next question, this will be directed to Gordon 
and uh, the other two candidates, but Gordon will start with the response. Uh, what are you going to do to protect Oregon's sovereignty if we're challenged, such as the state of Nevada? You know, the governor, with the power of the legislator, and the and leg legislators of the legislature, has the power of nullification. We can stop illegal, unconstitutional laws at our border. We can tell the EPA that their laws do not come into this state. We have our own EPA. We don't need the federal government, the federal EPA in here. We can take over our own lands. You know, there's a contract, you know, on the west side of, the, uh, of Colorado, over 50% of the lands are owned by the federal government. On the other side of Colorado, only 5% of the lands are owned by the federal government. We need to reclaim those lands. We need to stick up, stand up and stick up for ourselves. And if we're waiting for them to be benevolent and give it to us, it will never happen. It's been a lack of will and a lack of leadership that's caused the problems to get to this point. We need to assert our will, assert our state rights, and demand that land back. You know, you know it's a dysfunctional government when you cannot log a burnt out forest. And it's crazy. I've been all over this state. I've seen burnt trees all over the place standing and rotting. And that is just a waste. I've seen families that would give their eye teeth to go out there and get a living wage job, a family wage job, and yet the government is getting in the way. It's time to remove the roadblocks, get people back to work, put families and small businesses ahead of the will of the federal government. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Bruce, related to Oregon's sovereignty as governor, how would you protect it? Well, the first letter I'd write would be addressed to, from myself to the president, and it would be, and I would have on there uh, all 36 county sheriffs and their contact information, and it would say any federal person who's coming into our state, either an ag person, an IRS agent, OSHA agent, whoever comes in here, if they need to talk to one of our citizens, they're going to go talk to the county sheriff first and present their case to the county sheriff before they harass our citizens. Um, and, and there's a lot of federal rules that have to do with wildlife in this state that has stopped logging. Uh, you know, in my view, the Marine Mammals Act on the coast has nothing to do with extinction. It just protects those cute little mammals just because they're cute. There's no re rhyme or reason, and we've got like 300% more sea lions and seals on our coast than what is prudent. So, you know, I think I give them six months and then I'm going to say, we're going to start harvesting 10% of the seals and sea lions until we get our salmon back. Because that's where our problem is. You know, we keep talking about taking out dams to bring salmon back. I mean, that is ridiculous. You know, we know what the problem is. There, there's birds that are overpopulated that are eating the, the smolts and they're really small when they're trying to swim out. The, there's about a 300% overpopulation of the birds. And there's 10,000 seals at the mouth of the Columbia River waiting for the salmon when they start coming. And what do we do? We shoot them with rubber bullets and haul them back to the, I mean, that's ridiculous. We need to have a, a harvest on those guys just like we do anything else, any other animal in this state. And if we can't get that done, then the Indians are going to have an epiphany and that they got to kill 10 of these every single year to prove their manhood, and the Indians will start shooting them, and then they can go fight with the Indians, you know? I mean, we're going to figure out a way to, to get it done. Thanks. May, related to Oregon's sovereignty. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I would say that, you know, Bruce has the right idea um, because, you know, the sheriffs do actually have the the ultimate say, and they're the ones that have the jurisdiction in the state. Um, you know, the FDA and, and all those federal agencies really don't have the jurisdiction legally. It's actually the sheriffs that do. And so, um, you know, what what Mr. Um, Cuff said would be correct. And, um, you know, I think it would also be a good idea, like I mentioned before, if the state did go ahead and organize the state militia. That's something that's in our state constitution that allows us to do that. And that would give a little bit of a backup and maybe show the feds that, you know, we're serious. We, you know, we, we want to protect our sovereignty and, and, and we want our freedom. We don't want to be pushed around anymore. And so I think that would actually be a good idea. I mean, not that I'm trying to start a war or anything, but, 
that, but it's you know it's really time that we start standing seriously standing up for ourselves that way. Um, you know the other thing I'd like to see happen is we could come up with a like a, a constitutional um, you know, appoint a set of people that will kind of go through some of these these laws and and make sure that our state laws are aligning with the Constitution. I mean I think we have a lot a lot that aren't and and so we kind of need to to look at that but um, I don't know if I have much else to say about it. I can't think of anything else right now. I still have 30 seconds left. <laughs> and I'm, nothing's coming to me. But um, anyway, but yeah, sovereignty is very, very important, you know, and we do have that, our 10th Amendment right as a state, and, you know, and there's no reason why we shouldn't um, enforce that or, or, you know, press the state and say, hey, you know, or press the feds, I mean, is that, you know, you need to quit pushing us around. We, we need to flex our muscles as states, and that's what we need to do. Okay, uh, this next question is for Bruce. All three candidates, but I'll start with Bruce. Uh, would you be willing to look into the idea of having a state bank run by the state of Oregon similar to the North Dakota State Bank, and if yes, statewide, and if no, statewide? And I maybe I'd throw in there, would you see the advantage to having a state bank in the state of Oregon? Oh, well, that's one I've never really thought about. I, I always, I, I mean, I think I think about banking as a private, private matter. I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think uh, the, the state or the Fed should be in the banking business, either one. So, and and you know, we we don't have the ability to print money, you know, like the Fed does. So, I mean, I, I can't see that a benefit of having a, a state bank. Okay, thanks, Bruce. May. Um, yeah, I think I have a little hard time with that one as well. Um, but, um, you know, the Federal Reserve is definitely a big violation for us. And, and we do need to, the states, you know, I think the first thing we need to do is get our sovereignty back. But, but I think we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do about that dang Federal Reserve because it's a big problem. You know, charging us interest when you know they print the money and charge us interest and divvy it out. Um, it's a big problem. Yeah, I'm not sure how that works in Dakota, the the bank. <laughs> um, but um, well, there's actually a very big issue related to marijuana and the feds not allowing banks to take deposits from cash. It's all cash. So now the Fed is telling the banks don't want to touch it. So I wonder if that question yeah. is sort of... Well, you know, one thing, one thing you know, uh, that you're making me think of is our Constitution actually, you know, says that, you know, we're just really supposed to be paying our, our debts with pretty much it just refers to gold and silver coin. And, and the money's been turned into this paper that it used to, when they had the silver certificates, it used to actually be backed with real gold and silver, but now it doesn't really have any backing, which actually almost means that the that the the money that we're using now is really illegal anyway, and because the federal government has broke their contract with us, perhaps we could be breaking ours and, and, and doing our own bank. I'm not sure, but it's just a thought. Thanks, <laughs> Gordon? Uh, this question was uh, willing to look. Would you be willing to look into the idea of having a state bank run by the state of Oregon, similar to the North Dakota State Bank? If yes, why? And if no, why? Well, I would just ask you: Would you be willing to have a bank that was run like Cover Oregon was designed? No, of course not. All right, you know that's it. The government is inefficient. You know, and I don't think the government should be competing in the private sector. It has no place in the private sector. We want. We want uh, sound banking, sound, efficient banking. Uh, the more the government's getting involved, uh, the more inefficient it is. You know, when I opened up my campaign checking account, I had to sign my name no less than eight times because of the Frank Dodd Banking Act. Uh, they're worried about, you know, I don't know what they're worried about. Uh, it was horrendous. You know, I remember the day you go in and you'd sign a, an identification card and you were done and you could put your money in. and. Now, the more the government gets, the more inefficient it is. 
uh, the poor woman there at the bank, she couldn't really tell me on the record that it was Frank Dodd, but under her breath, it was Frank Dodd. You know, the government is just not efficient. And uh, just leave it to the private enterprise. I would like to correct you. Uh, the feds are allowing the banks in Colorado to take the deposits because the feds, you know, they want their hooks on the taxing well, They've started, right? just a matter yes. of whether it yes. gives banks all the authority to take yeah. that money. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We've got all the way through that question. So, no, no state banks. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. Uh, and Gordon, this comes to you. It comes to all the, I'm sorry, excuse me. It would be May's turn, all candidates respond. This would be, would you follow Michigan in removing race when hiring for government jobs or enrollment in education? That sounds um, fair to me, actually. I mean, personally, I believe that, you know, if you're an employer, it's up to you. I mean, you should be able to hire kind of anybody that you want. Um, you know, and with some of the, you know, government agencies, you know, I could see where maybe they might, you know, try to be a little bit more fair about how, you know, how they hire people and, and, and not, you know, base it on, on race or, but I mean, that you certainly, you would still need to base it on merit, but, um, but generally I would say that, um, that what um, Wisconsin or Michigan, I think Michigan, Michigan that what they did, um, that sounds generally um, okay to me because I have heard there's been, you know, it's getting kind of unfair in the sense that there there's some favoritism showed to minorities actually, and I think that's unfair. All right, good. Thanks, May. Thanks for. And then Sorry, it took me that's so okay. Hard. It's all right, Gordon. That would go to you oh. as well. And it's the question was: Would you follow Michigan as governor? Would you follow Michigan in removing race or affirmative action from hiring for government jobs or enrollment in education? Yes, I mean, uh, 50 years ago there was a need for affirmative action, but you know, over the years we've gotten better and better at uh, equalizing the situation, and now it's turned out to be reverse discrimination. And so we want to get rid of affirmative action, hire people, I mean, this is mostly in the public sector and in the, in the universities. We want to hire people in the public sector and uh, let attendance in the universities based on their abilities. It's not based on their sex, it's not based on the color of their skin. It has got to be based on their abilities and what's best for the community that is hiring them. So yes, I would follow Michigan's follow. Okay, thank you, Gordon. Bruce? Well, a lot of these affirmative action things, they'll have a percentage of business that's required to be given to minorities or women. And the problem is there's not a lot of businesses out there uh, that meet that criteria. So then what you wind up doing is you wind up hunting for them to try to find somebody that you could fill that 10% slot with. or And you wind up with the worst businesses in the world sometimes that you have to give contracts to based on the fact that they're a, 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 a business run by a woman or a business run by a certain race of people. That's ludicrous, in my opinion. Uh, inefficient. It, it doesn't make any sense. So, you know, it, and we're going the same way with the renewable energy thing. We're doing the same kind of thing with that kind of, you know, a percentage type thing that doesn't make any sense. So, um, no, I, I think it should be merit-based and... Uh, there was a time when, when that was an issue, but you know, I was in the army and I had a six foot six black first sergeant that reminded us all that we were green in his army. We weren't black, we weren't white. In fact, the brothers that went up with him, if he figured, if he knew their name the first day they were there, guess what they did the first weekend? They were on, they were on his duty for the first weekend because they were trying to saddle up to him. So, uh, you know, the army is a great equalizer. Uh, everybody's the same and. Uh, you know, my dad raised us kids to treat everybody equal, and it didn't matter, you know, what somebody's race or color was. And, you know, I had an opportunity to speak to the Black Caucus up in Portland, and I was told by a number of black people, don't go, that's the biggest racist group you'd ever want to see. And I went, and basically they wanted to know, what are you going to do for the black community? Right? And I said, well, what I'm planning on doing is going to be good for all Oregonians, not just the black community. And they got upset about that. Well, you know, Martin Luther King said, you know, uh, the, he, he wants to see a time when you're judged by the 
the content of your character, not the color of your skin. And those people aren't there yet, but I think we are. Okay, good deal. We'll move right along. Uh, and actually, this next question uh, for Bruce and all three, and this ties right into that, carrying the message forward. It, uh, what message do you have to get votes from Portland and Salem in the northern district of the state? And how would you get that message out through the media? I mean, what, what message related to the Republican side of things, given the Democratic, or excuse me, the demographic we've got to face? Right. Well, you know, I think a lot of the times, the, the populated areas, as I go around the state, I find people complaining about the fact that, you know, Multnomah County, Lane County, you know, Ashland, and where the colleges are and, and the, the, quote, the populated areas where a lot of liberals are, they, they think they're running the state. So my pushback all over the state has been, okay, look, you gotta stop complaining about Portland, Multnomah County, and you gotta be willing to go with me in there with the message. You know, what we're doing is we're gonna change the tax code so it's fair for everybody. We're gonna work on getting local control back in education, law enforcement, land use planning. That's good for everybody. It's not a Republican, Democrat issue. It's a what's right for Oregon. We've been so mismanaging the state for the past 28 years as Democrats collected power to the top, it's time to push that power back out to the local community. And, and I've got commitments from the guys from Hermiston, Pendleton, Milton Freewater, uh, Prineville, Madras, Bend. They're going with me to Portland. Right? And I want to have 1,500 boots on the ground. The problem is the precinct committee people in Portland, the precinct committee people in Lane County, they don't have enough people to go door to door and talk to the unaffiliated, the independents, and even the Democrats. Huge issue right now with the Democrats, Second Amendment rights. A lot of, second, a lot of Democrats love their guns, and they're trying to take them away. And, the, and that's an issue where we can connect with Democrats, say, you know, are you aware what... what your party and some of the leaders in your party are doing to restrict your Second Amendment rights. We drive that thing home, but we got to have people coming from the rural areas willing to go in. And I've already talked to the people in Multnomah County, Lane County, that hey, we're going to bring some people to help you, boots on the ground to help go out and get the message door to door to these folks that they're excited about. That's how we're going to win. May, the question was next to you is how would you get your message and get votes from the demographic? Portland, Salem, Northern Sector? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, last night I actually had an opportunity and went up to Portland and I did get a nice little interview up there. It was kind of short, but um, they, I think they're going to play that on Sunday. Um, so that'll reach a few people. Um, I'm really not getting up there a whole lot other than that. Um, but I just we kind of hope that more of the Democrats would kind of start waking up and start realizing that, you know, that we're going to have to pull together because, of course, a lot of, a lot of those Democrats are pretty stubborn. I mean, they're, <laughs> they're pretty stubborn and they tend to be about their, you know, their purse and their benefits. And so they're kind of stubborn that way. But, um, you know, I... A lot of people upset about what happened happening with uh, Cover Oregon too, and so I think we might find out that some people are going to turn away from Kitts Hopper, and maybe we'll end up with the Republican candidate, hopefully. <laughs> so, anyway, that's about it. <laughs> Thanks, man. Gordon. You know, Ronald Reagan carried Oregon, and his message is just like it's just, mine is the same as his. Freedom and prosperity. It rings across demographics. You know, the people in Portland, we're not the only one with high taxes in this state. The people in Portland have the same tax rate. We're not the only people in this state with a failing school. In fact, their schools are failing more. Up there, they spend $14,000 per child, and they've got the worst graduation rate in the whole state. It, you know, they've had 28 years of failed Democratic leadership, just like we have. Only their outcomes are even worse because they have multiple levels of democratic control. They are fed up to here with it. And given the opportunity for better paying jobs because we reduce regulations and reduce taxes, better education for their children because we're going to take control away from Salem, put it back in the local school districts, 
and then more freedom. I mean, it will resonate with those guys. Uh, and I understand they want, they're willing to walk out in the rain to get on a bus and ride a TriMet train. You know, that works in Portland. They're stacked up there, you know, 20 some stories high and, and there isn't room for all the cars. It doesn't work here. But what we have to do is educate them that if they don't let us manage our forests, you know, the fires we had last summer wiped out 10 years of CO2 savings that those people went out of their way to accumulate. We need to manage our woods in a way that we can keep the air clean, the water clean. They want the same things we do. They're just misguided and aren't educated. We can bring an education campaign up there and get them to come and think our way. Gordon, thank you. All right, next question, and uh, we'll start with Gordon. And this is related to uh, ONC lands and the Senate and the House, I'm sorry, the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives, they've worked on Land Grant Act 2013 and also trying to get the ONC Land Act back in. But as governor of Oregon, what would you do to facilitate this in, in complete disconnect with ONC lands and these counties that are starving? Gordon? Well, June 26th of last year, a federal judge in Washington, D.C. told the BLM, mandated the BLM, two things. You need to start harvesting lumber at 1.2 billion board feet on the ONC lands in the state of Oregon. Secondly, he said, I don't ever want to see your flawed, spotted owl computer model in my courtroom again. What the uh, radical environmentalists are bringing in flawed information and they're swaying the... Uh, the, the judges. The same thing is happening with the sage grouse in the uh, Oregon desert, just like it was the turtles down in Nevada. It's a bunch of malarkey. Currently, we're logging under 10% of the growth of the forest. There's over 75 billion board feet. Now, to facilitate us getting out there, I would give, as governor, the, the day after I'm sworn in, I'm going to go do some logging on the, on the ONC lands of Josephine County. Secondly, I'm going to give the BLM 30 days to follow that judge's orders. If they do not start timber sales within 30 days, I would take over the active management of the ONC lands with the State Forestry Division. We would start selling lands. I would guarantee that we would have a renewable supply for into perpetuity, and you could start watching mills open up across this state. We've lost over 280 mills in the last 30 years. Those are family wage jobs. They are multiplied many times over for the services that you need to supply the loggers and the mills. It would create prosperity and wealth in this state. That would be the quickest and best way to do it. Thank you. Bruce, that question was related to U.S. Senators and our congressmen not enacting anything with ONC lands. As governor, what would you do? Enough is enough. It's time for Bruce Cuff. I would... Uh, we have to we have to just uh, let them know that the lands that are in Oregon belong to Oregonians. They don't belong to the federal government anymore, and we need to log them ourselves. The the ONC lands. When we started logging those, we had 44 billion board feet of timber on them, and when they brought the spotted owl thing forward to try to basically say we had cut too much and we were cutting way too much timber. When they stopped cutting, they had 60 billion board feet because the counties had been putting uh, a full, uh, they were getting 75% 70, of, of the value from the stumpage fees and they were putting a third of that back into the land reforested in them. So they were running their county services on basically 50% and putting 25% that they got back into the forest. So they were, they were managing them well. And so, uh, if, so they stopped in the middle and, and just c cut off their nose or spite their face. You know, the, the government got involved and, and they let the environmentalists run us in the courts, in the federal courts. Well, this isn't federal. This is Oregon. We take the lands back. We got 53% of the forest. Even if I got to go out there and where it says national, we just stick state on it. The shoots state for us. Just stick a little sticker on there and just claim them and then say, they're Oregon's, you know, and whatever we got to do to get those 53% of the lands back and managed where we can log them ourselves and, and, and we'll do it ourselves. 
uh, we don't need the federal government uh, owning our lands. In fact, I don't think constitutionally they have the right to own our lands or to manage them at all. And what in the world is BLM doing managing forests? That is, that is the most ridiculous place to have it in the, in the first place. It should be Oregonians. Thank you. May, related to ONC lands. Um, what would you do? Yeah, um, definitely appears that, um, you know, what's going on now is the states are starting to wake up and realize that, hey, you know, the feds aren't supposed to be controlling this land anyway. So I don't, you know, I think in that we don't have to just focus on O and C lands. We can just go ahead and, um, you know, we should file a, the, we should get our legislative body to um, start some legislation like, like what I had read you that Idaho had done and, um, and basically just claim it. Um, you know, like Bruce said, that's what we need to do. We just need to claim it. And um, because according to, we just really, you know, it's just really boils down to just claiming it and just saying, you know, we're going to go ahead and take it back and um, look at, you know, how we can manage it well. Uh, I know there is a county, up, I believe that was Clatsop County, where they were, if I'm getting that right, they're doing a real good job of managing some forest land up there. They've been managing quite a bit of their own up there. And they, one of the meetings they were telling that they've got about the most pristine forest area up there in the whole state. And I mean, he even said the whole world, they said it's really, really nice. So they've been doing a good job. And, and we could do that over the whole state, you know, and a lot of what goes on in the forest, you know, it's not just about timber. Of course, timber's, you know, very, very valuable and, and definitely a lot of jobs there. But, um, you know, there's, well, I'm out of time. I'm gonna quit. <laughs> I'd like to make a couple points. There's two quick points I'd like to make. 30 One, seconds. If, if we let the state reclaim these lands, then we deny the environmentalists the equal access to justice laws. Two, I just read recently where Ecuador couldn't afford to pay back China on a loan. So the Ecuadorian government gave them 700,000 acres of their land. Now, if we don't get our land away from the feds and look at the money we owe China, what are they going to be doing with that land? You know, we need to get it back in our hands to keep the feds from giving it away for debt. Thanks. In fairness, Bruce, any response? 30 second, or you're fine with the next question? Gordon said it all. Okay. Uh, this is a question, next question for all three candidates, and uh, Bruce, this will go to you. I'll dissect this down, this came from the audience related to uh, protecting our youngest citizens and the pre-born. So, how do you feel, uh, pro-life, pro-choice, abortion, and uh, the, the parents that are left, of course, that causes into mental illness, you know, or if that goes into having to adjust. So you have the abortion and you have the families to deal with that. What would you do to help with that? And your position on? Right. Um, my position is basically, I, I think that the only reason for taking another life is self-defense. So, you know, I, I am, I am pro-life. Uh, you know, if the doctor tells the lady, uh, you know, this baby could cost you your life if you go full term, then I think it's up to, you know, her and her husband to sit down and discuss what they're going to do. I, you know, I, I would pray that she just go ahead and have the child and put her hand, her, herself in the hands of God because doctors don't know. You know, I mean, that's what I, but that's, that's a decision for her to make at that point is kind of what I, where I'm at. Cause it's, it comes down to the self-defense issue. Um, I, I have a cousin who's got a daughter that, uh, she, uh, she had an abortion and every year on that, in that month, uh, the one year after, uh, one year after that, uh, she tried to commit suicide and every year it just, something happens to her breaks her arm or has a wreck or, you know, just, I mean, so there's this huge, you know, for them to say that, uh, you know, there's, it doesn't affect women when they, when they make that choice is, is ludicrous. I mean, um, you know, that, that is a child and, you know, I, and obviously, you know, uh, all believers are going to, if, if they've aborted any kids, they're going to meet them in heaven and they're going to realize, you know, that they, that they were real live people. Uh, my wife and I lost a, 
a child between uh, between our youngest two and uh, a miscarriage, and I'll tell you that's that's traumatic. I mean, you know, when you when you're you know you're, you're expecting a child and then you lose it to even to a miscarriage, it, it's it's awful. So um, yeah, I mean, there there has to be more education, more ultrasounds to show folks what they're really doing, and then. You know, once they make that choice, it is a it's it's a life changing thing that's got to you know we're going to have to help them through it. May, uh, are you pro choice, pro life, and your reason why? And then how would you help with the families? Um. Yeah, I am pro life, and um, you know, it's one of the saddest days of history. You know, in history, when they did the Roe versus Wade and. And basically, you know, said that it. Yeah, I think what it was about. They were saying that it was a, a privacy issue for the woman. I believe is how they justified it. Um, anyway, it's um, so I'm say you know I'm a hundred percent pro-life. You know, I don't really believe there should be any exceptions. I guess I align myself with the Constitution Party, which basically says no exceptions. Um, the Constitution. Constitution Party Chairman Jack Allen Brown, he wrote a really good petition that I'd like to see come out. And I think they tried to get it around shortly for a little while, but I don't know. It's just, I think people were just too busy and they never got it around the state. But what it was, was it was a petition that would make it illegal for anyone to take payment for performing an abortion. And um, I thought that was a real good petition, the way that Jack had that written. Um, but yeah, education, definitely, you know, trying to make people realize that, you know, it's a human being inside the womb. It's not, you know, anything else. It's not a frog or <laughs> it's a human being. And so, um, it's definitely, um, consider that as murder and it's wrong. So that's where I stand on that. Okay. Thanks, man. Gordon? Well, I'm definitely pro-life. And I think, uh, you know, we should get in there and be able to showcase some alternatives to these women. You know, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, counseling, ultrasound, so that they can see the development of the fetus, you know, uh, medical coverage, so that they don't have to worry about paying for the cost of going full term and offer them some assistance with the uh, adoption. I mean, we have to come up with a sound alternative that meets the need of the woman and keeps the baby alive. Uh, that being said, I also believe there should be no taxpayer funding. If, as a, you know, as a God-fearing Christian, I want no part of subsidizing the cost of an abortion. Uh, I also don't believe that, uh, and as a, as a governor, I think we should try to limit abortion. I've seen studies where the fetuses feel pain after 20 weeks. You know, if you haven't made your mind up by five months pregnancy, uh, you know, then, you know, you need to carry on and go full term. I, mean, we, I don't want anybody to feel pain. My, my campaign is based around doing no harm to anybody, and I don't want to see harm brought to those babies either. So, uh, you know, the, the chances of outlying abortion uh, with the current courts and the current judicial system is pretty much slim to none. So we need to focus on the alternatives and we can make the biggest gains in that department. Thank you. All right. Our next question, uh, May, this will come to you, is uh, your, please give us your toughest three business decisions you ever made and why. Oh, gee. <laughs> Tough three business decisions. I don't know. It doesn't really seem like anything's been, my decisions have been that tough. I don't. <laughs> Maybe biggest, um, your biggest, hardest decision. Biggest. And, and if you don't have the business, you can go into the personal, but I prefer. Yeah, well, um, I do operate a business with my husband, Jim. Um, boy, toughest business <laughs> decision. Um, <laughs> you know, my husband and I, we operate this business that we have together, and I lean on him a lot, and and so, I mean, I have to admit, <laughs> I do, and, you know, um, although he's kind of 
he injured his leg real bad about um, in 2007. And when he injured his leg, I had to, you know, pony up and, and pretty much take over. Jim had six surgeries on his leg, and so I was taking care of Jim and running our business, and it's just kind of a little business. We don't have, you know, occasionally we'll have a little bit of help come in, although we, you know, it's kind of little in a way and kind of big in a way. We got about 10,000 square feet of, of lumber at our place, and so I had to, you know, pony up and run the forklift and take the lumber off the truck and take care of Jim, and there's not really much decision going on. You just do what you have to do, and, and, and so, I don't know, it was just <laughs> a matter of doing what I had to do. Um, there was one decision that was a little bit hard for me. Um, my husband and I became partners in a newspaper, and, and we, you know, I was on this board of directors with this paper, and I just had a kind of a hard time with the people because they were less conservative than me on spending, and I wanted to cut the spending back and not spend the way they wanted to spend. And so I kind of had to decide just to walk away from the business and we just lost our investment on it basically because I didn't like the direction that they were going with it. And that was kind of difficult. Okay. I don't Thanks, know. Man. That's about it. <laughs> Gordon, your toughest three business decisions and you ever made and why? Well, I won't say they were the three biz hardest. Uh, there's some lessons that I learned. Uh, very early in life, I, uh, when I was a young man, I was dating some of my employees, or one of my employees. I learned a long time ago, you don't date the help. You know, that is uh, the tail <laughs> wagging the dog in that situation. So, you know, at business, it's all about business. It's got to be that way. Uh, one of the hardest things I had to do was terminate a 15-year employee, somebody that had been with me, helped me uh, get through my business, and uh, we came to a crossing in the road that uh, we couldn't get by, and it was a very difficult decision. Uh, the other, the most difficult, uh, the most difficult business uh, situation I was ever in was when uh, my right-hand man and his wife uh, were killed in a head-on collision going down to California. It was. Uh, a drunk driver came off of the on-ramp, driving the wrong way on I-5, and uh, and took out two wonderful people. And uh, their son uh, was an employee of mine and continued to be. And uh, I still think about that family uh, quite often. It uh, it it was a uh, devastating time for me and a devastating time for my business. Uh, it, my business took a hit for about two years. Uh, he was. Uh, he was uh, a, a very loyal. He, 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 his strengths were my weaknesses. He, he took care of my weak points and uh, made my company the better for it. So those are it. All right, Corey. Bruce, your toughest three business decisions you ever had to make, and why? Well, the way I work is I, I work for God. I mean, he, he is my source. He is what, uh, you know, every job I've had, my dad always taught me, you know, when you're working, son, you do your best, whether the desire is on you or not, because you're not working for him, you're working for uh, somebody higher. So um, when uh, a company that I worked for, they, they did something unethically. I had been working there for a number of years, and they had made an ethical decision that I could not get them to change and so I walked away from a job that was a very high paying job and uh, uh, and my wife when I got home I usually I stayed all night at this at this job and uh, but I got home and my wife said what are you doing home and I said I quit and she said good and then five minutes later she said now what are you gonna do and I said well I think I'll try real estate and she said okay well you know but you don't just start a real estate business, you know. So the, 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 that next week, I got a call from uh, another company that wanted to hire me, like immediately, when they found out that I was on the street. And I said, "Look, I'm not interested in being hired, but you know, the computer system that you're installing up there." I said, "I installed these other guys. I can make that work." And I, I said, "I just started a company called Cuffs Consulting." I said, "And I'll come up there and work for three days a week at ten bucks an hour on the way I'm driving up, and forty-five bucks an hour when I'm on site, 
If that works out for you guys, let's do it. They said, okay. So, uh, so God worked it out. So while I started my real estate business, I had this other thing going on that, that paid the bills until I got it going. The other decision that we had to make recently was uh, in 2007, when the real estate market went down, uh, we had to make some changes. We had to diversify our income to, to keep going. And, uh, but, but all the time, we just trust in God. That's, that's the way that uh, my wife and I have always worked. All right, good deal. Yeah, a couple of minutes before we go into our closing statements. Um, in a bulleted type form, and this question would go to Gordon first, uh, in, and I don't want to do two minutes on this. I want to do about a minute. Can we do a minute on this, uh, Kevin? Uh, related to your values. So no sentences so much, but the words of your values. If you could bullet those. So, Gordon, your bulleted values that you hold near and dear to your heart. I'm God-fearing. I'm honest, I'm a hard-working, dedicated American. I bleed red, white, and blue. I love this country. I love this state. I love my family. I love my grandkids. And I want to be able to help the families of Oregon do better than what they have now. Bruce, I'll give you a minute of values held near and dear to your heart. Number one relationship in my life is with Jesus Christ. And when I stand before him one day, I want to hear him say, well done. That's number one. Number two, my wife, relationship with my wife is more important to me than any other relationship besides my relationship with God. And um, the reason I'm in this race is because I believe that God called me to be governor of Oregon. That's why I'm doing this. Now, whether I'm going to win or not, it's up to God and it's up to the voters. But I'm doing everything I can to put myself in a position to win. Um, my children are, are important to me. And by extension, the families of Oregon that have gotten a raw deal in the last 28 years and we just need to get control back in Oregon. And that's, that's what I'm hoping for and working for. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, May, in a minute, your values. Um, yeah, God, be number one for certain. Um, just um, trying to always, every day, you know, pay attention to your conscience. I mean, I believe God gives us a conscience, and that's, um, you know, his light trying to, shine a shine a light a path you know shine a light on the path so that we can stay on that path and so god definitely number one and and then family very important my husband jim um, and um just um patriotic towards the country love of country um putting america first uh, we see that, you know, a lot of the legislative people, for some reason, they get dra dragged into, you know, with these other countries and what we need to do for them. And we, we need to um, get ourselves straightened out before we think about helping the other countries. We're kind of a mess. Um, let's see, what else do we need to talk about? <laughs> let's see, that may be, but I guess I'm out of time. Okay. Okay. Thank you, candidates, uh, very much, and thank you, guests, for your questions tonight. Very, very good on that. What I want to go into next is our uh, closing statements. And May, in the reverse order, you're up. So I want to remind you to please use the podium. And you've got five minutes for a closing statement. what I'm going to say. I'm just saying it as I'm <laughs> thinking of it as I'm here. Um, well, tell Oregonians so, what you're going to do for them. What I'm going to do? Oh, that reminds me. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Well, one thing that I would like to see happen is to um, have a constitutional um, group of people put together to I'm trying to remember the term that I was calling it, but just the governor's task force of people that are constitutionally minded that would, you know, help the governor with, you know, determining what we can do to relieve the regulations. Um, and I think we want to do that right away. I think that would help tremendously. Um, you know, taxes as far as the income tax. I, I'm thinking that, you know, we could maybe look at maybe trying to reduce it right away like 5%, but I'm thinking if we could reduce those regulations right away, that that would help get jobs. I think, I bet you if we could drop regulations way down, I bet you anything that we could probably see 25 to 50% drop in unemployment is what I think. And then I think once that unemployment was to go down, then we could start looking at dropping taxes a little bit more. Um, and we also need to look at this, the um, public sector is way too large. It needs to be made smaller. You know, I think we need to drop the amount of, the amount of people that are employed by the, the public sector, by the government, in my opinion. Um, but I'm thinking even that should be kind of done slowly because we don't, you know, people have jobs, and but it, as the private sector picks up speed, we try to start dropping down some of the, the public sector jobs and um, having it to where, you know, helping us not to have to have so high a ta taxes. Um, anyway, I'm just very, very hopeful that somehow we can get a real Republican governor in the office. Um, you know, if we get somebody like Dennis Richardson, if he, if he makes the cut, I suspect that I would likely be switching parties to the Constitution Party because the Republican Party has not done its job if it doesn't get a real conservative in there. Um, we got a lot of neoconservatives out there that just, you know, try to look like they're conservative, but they're really not. They're, they're becoming socialistic. A lot of our, our people in the Republican Party have more socialistic ideas and worse than socialistic. I mean, they, you know, I, you know what Dennis Richardson wants to do with encouraging those Chinese factories in, I mean, I just see it as inviting an invasion. I mean, I, I even call it, call it concealed surrender. It's just a way of, of making it look like, you know, we're, we're just doing this because we need a better economy, but we're actually slowly giving up America and slowly giving up what we stand for. So, um, anyway, I'm just hoping and praying that we'll get a real conservative in there. It's, you know, it's not about me. And it's not about any of us up, up here, really. It's, it's about, about getting our country set back set back up in the position where we used to, to be and getting us, ourselves on the right path. Um, it's about protecting our freedoms and our liberty. I mean, that's what America is all about, is having our freedom and our liberty. It's, it's not so much about economy. Too many, too many politicians, I think, focus on the economy. And I think we need to focus on liberty and, and freedom. And, and that's where our happiness lies. And, and um, anyway, I... So it's a long five minutes here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not real prepared. You know, I, I, I will also tell you that um, I do oppose GMOs. Um, you know, I think it would be a good idea to, for the state to have some sort of legislation to ban the sale of GMO seed in this state. And I haven't really heard too many people talk about that. They talk about... Um, you know, making it so that individuals cannot, you know, grow grow it. Um, of course, banning the sale wouldn't, you know, you could still go to another state and buy it, but, um, you know, ideally it wouldn't be grown here at all. I think it's actually rather disrespectful to God, you know. You know, he's, he's the one that knows how to, that, you know, do the creating, and he, he created the seeds the way he created them, and, and the fruit, and the vegetables the way he created them and when man thinks he can do better he's just um, believing a lie so um, anyway thanks
Bruce, thank you. Well, as governor of the state of Oregon, I would get it back to the basics that we were actually, the state of Oregon is designed to do, and that is to take care of our transportation system, focus on public safety, and manage our state lands. Those are the three functions of state government, and, and we've gotten totally out of that. When they passed Measure 5, and we, and we basically shifted, we controlled property taxes because they were going up too fast, we shifted the cost of education to the state government, we lost control of it. And in 1997, when we consolidated school districts, uh, the little school district that my kids went to, Mary Lynn, there in Lyons, it had an eight-member school board that we had control over that was K through eight. When they consolidated, we lost our school board, we lost our budgeting process there, and it went to the high school. We have one member on a nine-member board, and they have roving members, but they're always elected from the population center, so we have one member. So we have no control of our school locally anymore because of that. So the government, the state government needs to be focused on those three things, transportation, public safety, managing the state lands. Education is a local issue. We remove the taxes from the state government. We, we let them fund it locally with a local sales tax. We cut out the property tax. We cut out all taxes on business. So we have business coming to Oregon because there'd be zero taxes on them. And we have a local sales tax in the county. That's the only tax you'd have. You have a 6% sales tax at the, or 6% income tax at the state level to fund state government. And you would have a local sales tax. Every individual county would have its own local sales tax to fund the county, city, and education. Inheritance tax is gone. Capital gains on retirement is gone. Property tax is gone. Personal property tax and businesses pay is gone. And business tax is gone. You have that all gone, you replace it. What's nice is you can fire every single assessor in all 36 counties and take that money that you pay for that assessing department and move it over to public safety in the sheriff's office. Done. You, you just funded your local sheriff department. So there's a lot of ways to do that. But education locally, the only way, even if we're funding it locally, the only way to really get the cost driven out of the system is with education savings accounts to where parents have control of the money for their child. The state now spends $10,000 per child average for, for somebody to go to school. If the state would give 70% of that money, a $7,000 a year, uh, into an account for every single child in the state of Oregon, let the parents direct where their kids go to school, they could find a public school for $5,000 a year for the four years their kid went to high school, they spend $20,000 to educate their child. At the end of that four years, there's two thousand dollars they didn't spend. They'd have eight thousand dollars in this account that they could use to to send their kid to uh, the college. You know they don't get any more money after K through 12, but they could use that education savings account to to do that with. So there's a lot of different ways. The Cascade Policy Institute already has this all drawn up out of Portland. They've got the education savings account figured out. They're using it in Arizona now. It's working great. We bring it here. We we drive cost out of the education system. And we just we developed a lot more alternatives. We've got 197 school districts. We should have a thousand school districts. You know, all these little schools. You know, we ought to have right now where I live, Idana, Detroit, Gates, Mill City, up the canyon. Gates used to have a school. No more. I mean, uh, Idana, Detroit, has 500 people living up there. They used to have a school. School got closed. They had a charter school for a number of years. They finally closed the charter school. There's no school up there. So, uh, so all those kids that were living in Gates had to get bussed by the dam, or I mean in uh, Detroit, Indiana, had to get bussed by the dam down to Gates to go to school. You think parents are doing that? No, they moved. So now Gates, they just closed Gates School. So there's no school, uh, this is 17 miles up from, from, uh, from uh, Mill City, to, to, there's no school there. Gates, there's no school in Gates. They all come down to Mill City to go to school, the St. Anne School District. So all the... All, there's no families up the canyon anymore. They've all moved down to where their kids can go to school. That's a travesty. So if we have education savings accounts and we could start these little school districts, there's schools, there's schools sitting empty right now. There's one in Gates we could have a charter school or a private school in and give parents the right to, to direct that money, and we'd have a school there in Gates. And, and this is, this is uh, multiply all over Oregon is what's going on. The same exact thing, consolidation, consolidation, consolidation for control. 
education's got to be a local issue, and we have to fund it locally. So I, I need your vote. Enough is enough. It's time for Bruce Kev. I know I could get elected in this state. I know I could beat Kitts Hopper by half a million votes, and I got a plan to do it. Thank you. Gordon? I really feel that Oregon is at a tipping point. You know, I heard today that Oregon is number one in the nation in food stamps. Now, didn't that make you proud? You know, you know, I, I, I look at the legislature and I see what's going on up there. You know, the unions, the public sector unions are well represented. Well represented. The big corporations, they're well represented. Who's not represented? It's the families and the small business owners of this state that have been denied representation. As governor, I want to be their voice. You know, the heart of any state is jobs. Jobs, jobs, and jobs. Jobs provide the taxing mechanism so that you can have schools, roads, police, and the safety net. The, the job of the state is to provide for the very young, the very sick, and the very old. If you're a working age and you are physically okay, we want to find a job for you. We have got to stand up for the working folks. I've been all over this state. I've seen where a married couple was working at a, a hamburger ice cream shop, making minimum wage. His wife works part-time in a grocery store, and they have five kids. They're on food stamps. There are no good-paying jobs in this state. I've, I've traveled thousands of miles. I haven't found any. You know, when I meet the people, they're all starving for jobs. That's got to be the focus. That's why we need to get back out into the woods. That's why we have to, once again, become a resource-based economy. You cannot provide family wage jobs working in motels, pumping gas, or schlopping food in a restaurant. They're all minimum wage jobs. We've got to create, uh, allow industry to come back and get back out there and create some family wage jobs. So once again, the people of this state, including the people in Multnomah County, they're just as poor as we are. I believe this message will resonate with them. It's got to be jobs. And when you get done with that, it's got to be more jobs. And when you get done with that, it's got to be more jobs. Well, I want I want Oregon to be a magnet for people coming from other states. Let them know that there's work here. That'll put all the carpenters and all the contractors busy building more house, houses, building more schools, building more shopping centers. We have to broaden our tax base, not raise it so high and shrink it. The number of you know businesses in this state are shrinking. And they're getting smaller and smaller every year. We have got to put our focus back on where it is. Our focus has got to be on families. I feel sorry for these people that can't, you know, they're hard working. They, they're out there working every day. They're working 40, 60 hours a week. But because of Obamacare, their hours got cut down to 30 so that some corporation could get out of buying their health insurance. We've got to really look at the consequences of what's going on. We have to tell the public sector unions, you know, we, we can't give you those big races. We have to focus on the families. Here, here in Medford, we had a teacher strike for two weeks. They went out strike. The average teacher was costing each of us, or the taxpayers, $105,000. They weren't happy with that. I still haven't heard about the contract came up with, but I'll tell you this, the median income in Jackson County is $39,000. Those teachers are costing us over two and a half times what I and you guys are making. That's not fair. They're not elite. They shouldn't get any more raises until the people in this county start making some more money. And believe you me, if the, if the city, county, and state employees couldn't make any more money until the citizens of this state became wealthier, guess what? When you went in to get a building permit to start a business, you'd probably find them a lot more accommodating instead of no, 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 no. That's all you ever hear now. You can't do this. You can't do that. Why don't they tell you, here's what you can do? Why aren't they helpful? We've got to change the culture in, state, in the state offices. I believe that starts at the top. We, we need a leadership change. We need a culture change. We want people that work in DMV and the state office that are helpful. And we need to work our people off of welfare. Right now, you know, when you're on welfare, if you make a dollar over a, a, some limit that the state says, they cut you off of welfare. Well, we should be promoting them to work. If they make five dollars, we're only going to cut one dollar off of their food stamps or the welfare. We want to promote them to become wealthier and, and, and develop that work ethic. 
I've had a work ethic my whole life. I'm willing to go to work for the people of Oregon to help the families and to help the small business owners. Those are the job creators in this state. And, you know, we cannot let the career politicians and the lawyers no longer lead us. They've gotten us into this mess, and if you think they're going to get us out, then vote for the Democrat. My name's Gordon Chalstrom, and I tell you this, you know, you elect a lawyer, you get more laws. Elect a businessman, you get more jobs. I'm Gordon Chalstrom, and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. All right, let's get a round of applause for our candidates, please. Uh, that pretty much concludes our evening. I do have a couple of comments. Uh, first off, I uh, want to give a round of applause and thank you to Kevin and Colby and Debbie for putting on this forum and inviting our, our candidates down. It's a lot of work. Also, too, uh, I thought about a lot of things to say tonight, but there's a, there's a number of quotes that I could say that I, I think the biggest thing that's going on right now, and these candidates share my views, is we, we need to, um, as Americans, we should be empowered. We should be empowered because of the rights of the Constitution that have been given to us. And I talked a little bit about the flag earlier. But the situation is, we have rights afforded to us that are nowhere else in the world. And they've been fought for, and men and women have died. Patriots have gone before us to fight for these rights. And democracy is a lot of work. And I think ultimately we should be empowered every day when we get up to be thankful for where we're at. But it's our job to hold our politicians accountable for what they say they're going to do. And, and I think when I look through the political system, whether it's local or state or federal, the people are not doing their job. We, the people, are not doing our job and standing up together and holding the politicians accountable. We forget until the election process starts again, we have a chance to start over. And that's why I wanted to say tonight, we should feel empowered and we should pass that message on to everyone we see, find a way to have a dialogue that they will vote, because we can vote, and that is a wonderful privilege as Americans. So I just wanted to conclude with that. I, I have a, a quote from Thomas Jefferson. He says, I know of no safe depositor of the ultimate powers of a society but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. This is the true corrective of abuses of constitutional power. And so because of the education of our people, that's where we've fallen down. And, and I applaud Campaign for Liberty for spreading the, the idea of education. And I, I appreciate the candidates coming in today. So